Good evening. I'd like to thank those that are visiting with us, with coming out this evening. I'd like to thank the elders for letting me have another opportunity to present to you a portion of God's word. And I pray that the things that I may be an encouragement to you, maybe something that you need to think in your life of maybe changing your lifestyle um, and maybe having a little bit more passion on God. So in regards to the scripture reading, if you would turn to Psalm 63. And we'll be taking a lot from this uh, scripture. Uh, Psalm 63 is what we'll, we'll be taken from. And we'll be reading the whole chapter. O God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land. Where no water is to see the pow thy power and thy glory. So as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. Because thy loving kindness is better than life. My lips shall praise thee. Thus will I bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. My soul shall be satisfied as with morrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. When I remember thee upon my bed and meditate on thee in the night watches, because thou hast been my help, therefore in the shadow of the wings will I rejoice. My soul followeth hard after thee, thy right hand upholdeth me, but those that seek my soul to destroy it shall go into the lower parts of the earth. They shall fall by the sword. They shall be a portion, portion for foxes. But the king shall rejoice in God. Every one that sweareth by him shall glory. But the mouth of them that speak lies shall be stopped. And we'll go into more detail on these verses. But the, the main point of, of this is, is, is where David is in the wilderness. And what he's doing is worshiping his God. And what I'm, what I'd like to talk to you about is having a passion for my God. Cause I think this is a, a serious part in, in our everyday walks of life is having a passion for our God. And we'll look at some parts uh, in regards to his worship and what he, what he did there and uh, how it can relate to in our own life. So in regards to passion, you know, the definition for passion is a strong liking or desire for or devotion to some activity, object, or concept. You know, a lot of people may have a passion for hobbies, sports, your job, maybe a father and mother, and a husband and wife, and you have passion on each other. But, you know, that doesn't compare to what we should be having a passion on. You know, yes, all these things are great to have passion on, but one of the most important things we should have passion on is God and his word and how we should live by it because within our worship and everyday walks of life, because I think there's a lot that we can take away from having a passion on God uh, in, in regards to that. So the first part is I'll, I want to look at David's worship to God. If you look at what, what I just read in verse three, it says with his lips, he worshiped with his lips. My lips will praise thee. That's, that's the worship that he had. With his tongue, I will bless thee with, while I live. With his hands, I will lift my hands in thy name. With his mouth, and my mouth shall praise thee. In verse 5. In verse 6, with his memory, when I remember thee upon my bed. And with his intellect, he meditate on thee in the night watches. You know, when you look at some of these descriptions of David's worship, he lifted up his hands in his name. The mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. The shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. You know, when you consider these acts of worship that David showed, do you notice his praise and exuberant he had for his passion on God? You know, to me, it seems a little strange in some ways. Does it seem normal to raise your hands up? So that name, does it seem normal or strange to you on, on how David worshiped his God? You know, our worship and passion that we have towards God is not about the preacher. It's not about the lights in this building. It's not about the aesthetics. It's about how we speak and respond to the truth and see God for who he is. And I think that's what we're going to look at in regards to these verses and how we can apply it uh, in our own life and how we should be worshiping. So if you would turn to Psalms chapter 95. Psalms 
Psalms 95, 1 through 3, it says, Oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. It says the shouting joyfully and outpouring of praise is a response to the truth. It's not about the outward appearance of making, of, of singing and shouting. But what if someone has truth but no passion? Passion comes from truth. But what if someone has no zeal and knows the truth? You know, worship, what if it's lifeless? Is your, is your worship lifeless? Is it dead? Is it cold? You know, a good analogy of this is when I think of a temperature gauge. Are you on the blue where you're cold? Your worship is cold? Are you hot? Or are you in the middle? Because in Revelation 3 and 16, so then become, then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. You know, devotion to our, to our God in regards to temperature is mentioned here in Revelation 3.16. Here you can see that it says that this church was lukewarm. Is your worship lukewarm? Because it says, I will spew thee out of my mouth. You know, this, this church was neither demonstrating the zeal, devotion, and passion they should have had with their God. Well, what is your heart in regards to the devotion to God? Is it on fire where this air is going? Showing zeal and passion towards him, just like David showed in his song? Are you shouting joyfully and, and sincere in your devotion? Or maybe you're on the other side where you're cold and care, care less about it, devoting your service and passion towards God? Or, you're, or are you saying, oh, I'm just here. It's another routine in my, my schedule. I, I just, I just got to be here. My parents make me. Or maybe I'm in the middle where I'm, I'm a little different. I'm not fully committing my zeal and passion to God, but I, I'm hearing and listening and hearing about Jesus and singing about Jesus, about him. Do you have a cold heart today? I can't answer that, but I hope and pray that you will find some way to show the desire, passion, and zeal to devote your life to God and your worship. So as we begin, let's, let's consider a question. Can you show reverence to God and still be exuberant, full of zeal in your worship? Let's think of something. So cold, lifeless worship. I'm not saying about this church in general, but empty, meaningless prayers. Those that just keep on repetitive. Distracted partaking of the Lord's Supper. Lifeless sermons. Do we expect to leave the service to stir up one another with love and good works? Uh, do we expect to leave the service that there is difference in my life now and I will continue to follow Jesus and be fully equipped with God this week? The answer is no. When you consider 1 Corinthians 14 and 40, so let all things be done decently in order. You know, many people think of the traditions that we have here. Or maybe you go to a different congregation. Have you ever been to a congregation that you see them doing something with passion and still showing reverence to God? You know, their traditions may not be like the ones we see in our congregation. But let's keep in mind what our focus is with our worship towards God. If you want to bend your knee to pray, do it. If you want to sing and shout to the Lord, do it. I don't see any issues as long as it's not look, looked of showing your outer appearance, but doing it from a heart. And let's consider a couple other verses to make sure you fully understand this. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 16 through 18, it says, Moreover, when you fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you that they have their reward. 
But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thy head and wash thy face, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto the Father, which is in secret. And thy Father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. You know, these verses teach us the outward appearance of worshiping in regards to fasting. And it's not how God wants us to be seen. He wants us to be done. He wants, wants it to be done in secret, as you can see here. That they may have the reward with him in the end. And in Isaiah 29 and 13, it says, Wherefore the Lord saith, For as much as this people draw near with me with their mouth and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward men is caught by the precept of men. You know, Isaiah's account shows the attitude and honor they are showing with their singing, but their heart is not with thee, as you see there. Passion in regards to your worship is not about the position of the body. It's about the disposition of the heart. Let me suggest to you that maybe your passion, your exuberant, your fire has gone and become stale, cold, lifeless, and this is just a routine. Well, let's take a look at three things of David's worship that you can consider in your own worship and passion to God. So the first thing is, David saw three, three things and it's from Psalm 63. In verse 6 through 7, it says, When I remember thee upon my bed and meditate on thee in the night watches, because thou hast been my help, therefore in the shadow of the wings will I rejoice. You know, David remembers realizes and recognizes that God was with him. The lion and the bear in the wilderness, you were with me. Facing the giant in the valley by, him, by himself, you were with me. Becoming king and being king, you were with me. In the times of family and sin, but through your grace you forgave me, and you were with me. Even here when he, fors he was forsaken by his country, forsaken by his family, he was with him. You know, this passion and zeal that David showed towards God of what has been, let's think of what God has done for you in your life to reignite your zeal for God. I'm not talking about the church here, about how we get reunited each week. I'm talking about yourself. How do you get reignited each week with your zeal? You know, Remember some of, of what the Lord has done for you. Let's look at some other verses. In Psalms 103, 2 through 5, it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfieth thy mouth with good things so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. I like to look into these verses a little bit more. So the first thing, as you notice, is in verse 3. It says, who healeth all thy diseases. Has he healed any sickness in your life that you had? Maybe that has happened in the past? Or a loved one had, or even a family member had? where you are praying on your knees to get over the sickness, praising the Lord, the passion that you had. That's one thing he's, he has made, may have done. That's what he did with David here. Another thing is, in those verses, you can see in verse 4 and 5, it says, who, crown, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfieth thy mouth with good things. You know, remember some of uh, who crowned thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. You ever wonder why things are so good? Far from what we really deserve of it. Why would God love us for what we have done to him? Why on earth would he give us what we have? I'm not just talking about heaven and Jesus. But look at verse 5 there. It says, who satisfied thy mouth with good things. He's given us a lot of good things. We are so blessed in this country that we should never doubt about the amount of dollars that we will be looking for food or anything in this life in general. 
We are satisfied with what we have, and that is because God gave us it. As we talked about our gifts earlier uh, this morning in the lesson, talking about talents, strength of our bodies, the wisdom of our minds, opportunity of things to do. As a question, has, has he satisfied your time and life with good years and good things? Because that's what he's kind of talking about here. I hope and pray, yes. Another thing is, from those verses in Psalms 103, talks about who forgiveth all thine iniquities. You know, I can't answer this one for you. But think of maybe every evil thing you may have said to someone. Maybe evil, maybe even doing things in secret. Maybe that website you shouldn't have been on. Maybe that uh, thing you, you said and, and just the sins and the stains that you've committed. What's it say here? Who forgiveth all thine iniquities. He forgives you for those. And another part is who redeemeth thy life from destruction. You know, this destruction, another term for it is pit. You know, he could have stated, oh, you got yourself into this. And you got to come out of it. But that's not what he said here. He redeemed us so sinners can become saints or Saul's can become Paul's. And I think about some of the songs that we sing. It says, my son not sparing bled and died on the cross for you and I. You want to talk about passion for God? He redeems us from those sins. And you, another, oh, I'll go back to that in a minute. And another verse is in Peter, 2 Peter 1 and 9. It says, but he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see far off. And I've forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Now, we've been talking about in 2 Peter about those things that um, are needed for us. But he, it says he lacks these things. They can't see far off. So it was those old sins that he committed. He forgot about the blood. He forgot about Calvary. You want to have a genuine passion towards God? You need to set your mind and eyes on Calvary and pray on your knees daily. That's the, the mindset you should be having. So the next thing about David, Saul, is what is. And in verse 2 from Psalms 63, it says, To see thy power and thy glory, so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. You know, David was seeing the power and glory of God when he was in his presence. Do you see the power and glory of God each and every day of your life? Or is the world consuming you daily that you can't stand in his presence? Do you take the time when you're out in the world? Or is the life just too busy? I'm not just talking about being in the presence on Sunday morning and even, evening or Wednesday night. I'm talking about when you're in this world. Do you find the time to stand in his presence at work? around your family and friends, driving, when you know you shouldn't be in certain situations, do you stand in his presence? Because some verses to consider uh, to, of showing our glory and power to God. In Psalms 19 and verse 1, it says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. The heavens declare the glory of God. Is that what you are standing and looking for? The heavens, because the heavens declare the glory of God. In First Chronicles 29 and 11, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. He is head above all. But are we putting ourselves in the presence, looking towards that? the glory and the power and the victory and the majesty that we should be looking for. In Revelations 4 and 11, it says, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. You were created by God. It says, to receive glory and honor and power. Are we going to show that because he created all things? Romans, 11, or Romans 1, 19 through 20, it says, 
For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. Again, he's made everything. When we're out in the world, are we standing in his presence? Are we taking the time within our life to just think about how awesome and all we are with him? We should be. Something to consider when we talk about being in his presence. You know, when you, when you consider this picture, we see how big we are in some ways. Comparing some of the uh, planets. But we consider how maybe how strong or how powerful or how wealthy or how wise or how creative we are. But let's take a step back. We aren't so big after all. When looking at these bigger planets or even comparing the sun to all the planets, and so it's in which 330,000 uh, million star or planets can fit the sun. You know, look at what God has done in this power and the glory to show his beauty through his creation. Another thing to think about is the Milky Way holds over 100 billion stars. And God knows all the names of them. There are 2 trillion galaxies that can be seen. And there are somewhere between 10 million to 2 trillion stars in them. And God knows them by name. But, you know, another thing is, what is man? In Psalms 8, 4 through 6, it says, What is man that thou art mindful of him? And the son of man that thou visitest him. For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with the glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. God has given us a purpose of what is man. He knows you, and he knows me. He knows what we do each day. He knows our walks and talks. And we need to be in awe of his presence. This is why we need to step out of the world, step into his presence, and show the power and glory of God. Will you find time to be in his presence? I hope so. The last thing David saw in his Psalm 63 is from verses 9 through 11. But those that seek my soul to destroy it shall go into the lower parts of the earth. They shall fall by the sword. They shall be a portion for foxes. But the king shall rejoice in God. Every one that sweareth by him shall glory by the mouth. And then that speak lies shall be stopped. You know, if you think about this, some of these verses here, it says there's going to be lots of things that are going to be destroyed. But, the, but it says the king shall rejoice in God. Everyone that sweareth by him and shall glory. Again, that's talking about the glory and the passion that we need to be having. And in Re Revelations 1, four through eight, it says, John to the seven churches, which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him, which is, and which was, and which is to come. And from the seven spirits, which are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the Kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us his Kings and priests and the God and his father, to him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him, and all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. That last part is where, where I'm kind of thinking about what this part of what David saw. He is the beginning. He is the end. You know, this just shows that God has done so much for many people in the past and still is doing things for you and I today. And he watches and sees all you do. David was able to see through his passion and confidence what God would bring tomorrow. That is faith and trust of what God has granted us 
by sending his son to die on the cross for our sins so that we may and we can be redeemed. You know, we, we sing a song, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living because he lives. That's the mindset we should be having for tomorrow and having a zeal and passion towards our God. If Jesus does return, I hope and pray that we all will be in heaven where we'll be shouting and singing victory. That's why we shouldn't have fear about tomorrow. So another verse to kind of consider with this is in Romans 8, 18 through 25. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with the eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. The creation was subjected to fertility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. That the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to the corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of the childbirth until now. And not only creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of the bodies. For in this hope, we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, but the, for ho who hopes for what he sees. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. No, God glory, God's glory outweighs the sufferings we deal with each and every day of our life. That is what we should be waiting for patiently to have that reward in heaven. That's the mindset we should be having for tomorrow and having a zeal and passion towards our God. If Jesus does return, I hope and pray that we will have that be in heaven, like I mentioned earlier. But, you know, there is a hymn, actually, in the blue book that we sing. And it's actually called, I Have a Passion for My God. It says, I have a passion for my God. I have a passion for my God. He is first in my heart. Is he first in your heart every day? Throughout the day, every hour, every day? Is he first in my life? I hope and pray he is. He is first in all I do. Whatever we do in this life, we need to show that presence and the passion towards God. The essence of all good, the source of all that's true. He has given us the truth through his word. That's what we should be following. That's the passion we should be having. That's what we should be following daily, each and every day of our lives. In the second stanza, it says, I have a passion for my God. I have a passion for my God. He's the all of my heart. He's the all of my life. He's the all that I pursue. My God, my every breath and thought must be for you. Do you have that passion? Because in Matthew 22 and 37, it says, you shall love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Is he always in your heart? Is he always in your soul? Is he always in your mind? Because if not, you have that opportunity this evening. We can pray for you. If you have any sin in your life, as, you, as we noticed earlier, he forgives all those iniquities. He forgives those from all our sins. And that's, that's kind of the lesson for you this evening as why we should be having a passion, why we should be showing our presence to, towards God. So if you need the prayers of the congregation, we can help you this evening. If you need, uh, if you like to be baptized, you, you don't have a passion for your God if you're not baptized yet. Uh, if you'd like to be baptized, we, we can do that this evening as well. That's together we stand and sing the invitation song.